is Dr. David Tiedemeyer, who's a palliative care physician at Theta Care in Appleton in Nina, Wisconsin. He's on the faculty as a clinical professor of medicine and bioethics at the Medical College of Wisconsin. He enjoys being on the front line of medicine in the hospital. He was a visiting scholar here at the McLean Center in 1986-87. He has written or co-authored more than 125 papers and eight books focusing on the doctor-patient relationship and medical ethics. One of his books is a poetry book called House Calls, Rounds, and Healings, a poetry casebook. Dr. Schiedemeyer has an interest in the medical care of poor people, and part of his medical training occurred in Liberia, West Africa. In 1992, he completed a short sabbatical at Tuba City Hospital on the Western Navajo Reservation in Arizona. In the late 1990s, he's worked on a project to improve the skill levels of physicians working at primary care clinics in the former Soviet Republic of Georgia. He has his own office practice for many years at the County Hospital in Milwaukee, and he made house calls to see patients throughout the city. He also served for a time as the medical director of Family House Medical Clinic. Family House is a health ministry founded by Mrs. Cordelia Taylor to provide care for African Americans in the central city of Milwaukee. He is currently a palliative care consultant in several hospitals and is a hospital's medical director. Today, Dr. Schiedemeyer will speak on the topic of, quote, the chart. Dr. Schiedemeyer. Thanks so much, and thanks for bearing with one more talk. Chart, the chart entry, um, November 13th, 1990. Dear Dr. Siegler, thank you for incorporating these notes from me into the chart. I know of your interest and expertise in medical ethics. As a retired English professor here at the U of C, I thought you might be interested in putting these musings into my chart as a sort of literary addendum to my standard power of attorney for health care. As you know, my diabetes has not been kind to me, although you always have. Thank you for all you've done for me. Please file these pages in the chart. Anywhere will do. When I was a boy, I lived near Saxville the, on the Pine River. My father and mother were teachers. The Pine is a good natural trout stream. Its source is north of the mill pond over there at Wild Rose, and it flows west and south and grows deeper and colder at each fork. By the time it reaches the Wolf River, it is full of big native weasel brown trout that hide underneath logs and undercut banks. I fished or walked along the pine almost every day as a boy. I loved helping my father work on the stream. We put in rocks to deflect the current so it would move more swiftly, we, where it would scour the bottom and it would get deeper on the bends where that silt deposits. We built shelves of thick wooden planks for bank cover and we braced half logs against the shore. All of these changes created new habitat for the fish. Then during the hexagena hatch in mid-June when the giant mayflies rise by the millions, I would be surrounded by the trout. And when I caught them on hand-tied flies and I slipped them back into the water, I blessed them and I pointed them back toward the deep banks. Live long and prosper. Live down deep and cold. Live forever. I grew up staying outside all day. I learned the sounds and smells of nature. I know a spring peeper's voice, how it's different from a leopard frog and a bullfrog. I know the tricks played by butterflies, how the viceroy looks like a monarch, how eyes on the wings distract the predators. I've seen giant cecropia moths flying against the dawn sky in the dawn when only the planets are out, all the stars have disappeared. In my childhood, I heard the nighthawks boom as they swooped down on insects. Whippoorwills lulled me to sleep. Cedar waxwings trilled and their crusted heads swiveled as they watched me approach. I heard rustles in the bulrushes and the crackle of leaves from a thousand little wild feet, mostly mice and moles and voles. I tell you these things, just so you know what inspired me to spend my life writing. 
Mine was a rich childhood, and my parents loved me more than I had any right to expect. I was more than lucky. My father took me with him on outings of all sorts and taught me how to plant trees. My mother read to me and played the piano for me and fed me well. What more could a small boy want? Things tasted sweeter back then. I remember one of my favorite recipes. Grandma's hot fudge sauce, one cup sugar, one square chocolate, one quarter cup butter, one quarter cup milk. Melt in a saucepan, bring to boil for one minute. You can also use that as frosting for chocolate cake. <laughs> Hospital admission, August 1, 1976. John Catherwood, patient clothing and property list. One black belt, one pants gray, one shirt green, one pair of socks black, one pair of socks white, one pair of shoes black, one t-shirt gray, one underwear gray, one black watch in bag with belongings, $6.04 in pants pocket, all belongings kept with the patient. Signed, Melissa Smith, RN. I have checked the above list and acknowledge it to be correct. Signed, John Catherwood. August 2nd, 1976. Dietitian. Assessment, patient currently screened at low nutritional risk with usual good appetite, stable weight. Estimated caloric needs, 1,800 calories a day. Patient receptive to the review of decreased sodium and cholesterol foods. Patient currently making good choices but states, I'm going to do better. Patient does admit to some hypoglycemic reactions late morning. Patient is aware of symptoms and how to respond with food. Sign Carol Ent, registered dietitian. August 3rd, 1976, operative note. Pre-op diagnosis, gangrene of the distal part of the left foot. Post-op diagnosis, same. Nature of operation, left below the knee amputation. The patient was placed in the prone position under spinal anesthesia after being scrubbed. Drapes were placed in the usual fashion, wrapping completely the part of the left leg to be amputated. A fish mouth incision, was made with equal flaps, approximately 10 to 15 centimeters below the knee. The skin was incised up the fascial plane and superficial saphenous veins were divided and ligated. Muscle planes were incised and bleeders were ligated with 3 0 plane cat gut and part of the hemostasis was achieved with electropottery. The tibial vessels and nerves were divided and ligated with 2 0 chromic cat gut. Using a bone saw, the tibia and fibula bones were transected. Bone wax was used to stop local bleeding, and the rough edges were smoothed by rasp. Further hemostasis was then accomplished with electrocautery, and the stump was closed approximating the borders of the fascia with two ochromic cat gut over the bone ends. The skin was closed without tension in vertical mattress sutures with 3 0 silk. Two quarter inch Penrose drains were left in the subcutaneous tissue and a bulky dressing was applied. The patient tolerated the procedure well, being awake all the time, and the estimated blood loss was approximately 100 cc's. He was transferred to the recovery room in satisfactory condition, signed William DeVries, MD. Pathology note. Clinical diagnosis, gangrene of the left foot. Final pathologic diagnosis, left lower extremity gangrene. Gross examination. The specimen consists of a left lower extremity amputated below the knee. The site of transection of the fibula is 25 centimeters proximal to the lateral malleolus and the lateral aspect of the lower leg, nine centimeters proximal to the lateral malleolus is a six by eight centimeter ulcer covered by a blackish eschar. On the anterior aspect of the leg is a 10 by 6 centimeter ulcer covered by a black eschar. On the dorsum of the foot involving all but the little toes is a 11 by centimeter area of blackish discoloration of the, kin, of the skin 
and the lesser aspects of the first four toes are black and mummified. Microscopic examination reveals coagulative necrosis of skin, subcute tissue, and skeletal muscle. Signed, Beverly Crusher, MD. Primary care medical note, December 1, 1990, letter from Dr. Mark Siegler to Dr. Ellen Rilke, Assistant Professor of Medicine, Section of Nephrology, Department of Medicine, University of Chicago. <coughs> Dear Dr. Rilke, I'm sending my patient, Dr. John Catherwood, back to you for evaluation for possible dialysis. Let me briefly summarize his history. He's a 70-year-old man who first presented to the hospital at age 50 back in 1970 with polydipsia, polyuria, and polyphagia. He complained of blurred vision and was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. I began taking care of him in 1977. Unfortunately, he had required a left below the knee amputation the year before I began seeing him due to diabetic foot ulcers and gangrene of the toes. After that, of course, he began taking his diabetic control much more seriously. He also quit smoking. He lives in Hyde Park and was a professor of English here at the University of Chicago. Recent labs, November 30th, show that his creatinine and BUN are at dialysis level. His potassium is also elevated. He has developed some mild congestive heart failure. He has known coronary artery disease, but has refused further evaluation and is not a candidate for surgery. He does take cardiac meds. I think his fistula is ready for dialysis. Please consider enrolling him in our dialysis program as soon as possible. Thank you in advance for your care of Dr. Catherwood. Signed, Dr. Mark Siegler, Professor of Medicine, Section of General Internal Medicine. John Catherwood note continued. In 1940, at age 20, I fell in love with Catherine Young, the woman I would marry. I found some old cards, love letters, and poems we wrote to each other. On Valentine's Day in 1940, I wrote on a blue card with blue ink, this card is symbolic in the signing of love. The blue, the outer covering, may smear, but underneath, there is a deep surface which smears not and which endures. I chuckle at reading this now. We had our disagreements. Catherine wrote me once, I feel very badly that I didn't know you felt badly. Others saw the despair in your face and I missed it. You silenced your feelings and your hurt and my mind was silent to tell me they were there. How can two people so close be close to each other in the desperate hours? I should have been able to see something was bothering you. You should have been able to tell me. Why is love blind and silent? Another time, can true love leave and lovers drift apart? Can true love leave? Can there be a change of heart? Can't love cope with changes when time rearranges people, places? Have I abused love? Am I confusing love? Am I so mistaken? or is love shaped in daydreams, thoughts, and hopes. When I enlisted in the Navy Air Force, I was sent to Pensacola, where I flew in training but never got to the war. She wrote me this farewell poem. Sitting here with lonely thoughts of lovely you, pages written, hours spent on white bond with black print, Gilbert Bond, 25% cotton paper. So tired sitting here, I miss you so tonight that the black meshes with the white. I wish the cotton paper were my sheets and that the bond was with my lovely you. All meshed together we'd be, except for Gilbert and lonely. In 1947, I married Catherine. I was 27. The girl in the red jacket and I lived in an old gray shingled house. She stamped snow off her boots on the doorstep. Inside, I cooked supper, anticipating. Our love is like a January thaw for each other, unexpected warmth in the winter. Ice cracks and pops, like cubes in a soda glass, melting down together, becoming one. Then, our cold hearts warmed by the living water surrounding us, we dissolve completely and are poured out. We had our first child that next Christmas. I, I led a pretty quiet life. 
eventually teaching English here at the U of C. By 1955, we had four children. I remember 1955 was the year that the Ed Sullivan Show won the Emmy and Ernest Borgnine won the Best Actor Award. The president was Dwight D. Eisenhower. Dr. Jonas Salk had just discovered the polio vaccine, although we still feared polio. With much justification, several of our friends were stricken with it. And McDonald's opened its first restaurant in April. I was 35 then and in my prime. Teaching was going well. I was writing a lot, lecturing every semester. As I write this, I am 70 years old. I've had diabetes for more than 20 years, probably even 25, maybe 30 now that I think of it. I was first diagnosed in 1970, and I was getting ill even in the late 60s. I was 30 pounds overweight. I smoked a pack of cigarettes a day. I quit smoking in 1977 after my amputation and after Dr. Seeger told me that I had to quit. I was developing heart disease. Catherine, Bill, Amy, Sue, and Mike, my dear wife, my beloved children, I've been meaning to talk with you about my death. Every time I think of it, the words just walk away from me. I mean, how can I tell you how helpless I feel? My disease has robbed me of my leg and, in a way, my sense of self. It will surely kill me, but I want you each to know that I'm ready to die even though I would pre much prefer to live. Even though I'm completing a power of attorney, naming Catherine as my agent and Bill as the alternate agent, I want you to know that I will still try dialysis to help me with my kidney failure. I will, if you can forgive the pun, be taking my own sweet time to die of this disease. January 3rd, 1991, Renal Clinic, intern soap note. Subjective, the patient complains of some shortness of breath. He, he says this is worse with exertion, even usual activities such as brushing his teeth, taking a shower, making a meal. He denies any chest pain. Objective, temperature 97.1, pulse 100, respirations 18, blood pressure 140 over 90, weight 78 kilograms, heart, S1, S2 positive, third heart sound, lungs, crackles, extremities, 2 plus edema, fistula, loud brewery. Lab creatinine 10.5 today, potassium 5.9. Impression, end stage renal disease, plan. We'll discuss with staff, Dr. Rilke, signed William Riggs, intern. Attending, patient seen and examined, concur with exam, arterial venous fistula in the arm has matured. I did discuss the risks of dialysis with the patient. We'll plan to start dialysis tomorrow, January 4th. Signed, Ellen Rilke, MD, carbon copy to Dr. Mark Siegler. January 4th, 1991, dialysis unit notes. Type of dialysis, maintenance, patient type, outpatient. Schedule Monday, Wednesday, Friday, start time 0700, stop time 1000, duration three hours. By Jan Jankowski, RN, by Thomas Wilson Tech. Dia dialyzer CA211AB, machine B19. Patient dry weight, 72 kilograms. Pre-dialysis checklist complete. Post-dialysis checklist complete. Dialysis flow sheet complete. Correct dialyzer, yes. Sterility, yes. Machine prime, yes. Heparin volume, 400. Pre-dialysis BUN 90, post-dialysis BUN 36. Pre-dialysis creatinine 10.5, post-dialysis creatinine 2.2, post-dialysis weight, 73 kilograms. Patient developed mild chest pain during dialysis, which resolved with one nitroglycerin. Heptavax, Fluvax, Pneumovax given, hand films ordered, serum albumin, HIV, Hep B, ferritin, aluminum, PTH, phosphorus ordered. Signed, Jan Jankowski, RN. John Catherwood note continued, I want my most recent poem to Catherine to be the way I end my chart note. Valentine, if I say I love you more than the birds of the air, will you say you love me too? 
You deserve better than a retired academic, an old English professor who never wrote a blockbuster. <clears throat> Here from the upstairs window where I'm perched like a one-legged bird, I wish you a happy Valentine's Day and give thanks most of all for you, my beloved Catherine, so much more than I deserve. Signed, John Catherwood. Final chart note by Dr. Mark Siegler dated January 5th, 1991. Dr. John Catherwood died at home last night of an apparent cardiac cause. His wife called to let us know this morning. She says he did not feel well after dialysis and in the late evening developed chest pain, shortness of breath, and diaphoresis, and in a few minutes became unresponsive. He had previously requested a DNR order and had discussed all of this with her, so the paramedics were not called. An autopsy was not performed. <clears throat> Epilogue. John Catherwood walked into the stream. He would fish the Pine River at night, down near that deep hole under the bridge. His favorite fly was already tied on. His back cast was strong, smooth, and easy. Fireflies rose and fell all around him, illuminating the banks on both sides. His waders tightened around both of his legs. He could feel the water flowing swiftly by, but he was easily able to keep his footing. He heard a whippoorwill up, up above the willows on that oak ridge. It didn't seem possible that he was back here, but it didn't pay to think about it. The fish were rising. Thank you for the